Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Life Podcast with me, Dr. Drew. Hey, welcome, everybody. I want to thank our sponsors, of course, Social CBD, Dr. Drew Approved. Check those guys out. Learn more. Go to drdrew.com slash social CBD. Uh, also, you can get a 20% discount at checkout with the code DRDREW, Dr. Drew. But I'll tell you more about those guys at the break. Right now, it's my privilege to welcome Lana Turner. If you remember her from This Life episode 142, it's available on iTunes and YouTube. Lana is back today, and she's, uh, you can, well, let me give your, pod, your <laughs> website first, lanaturner.com, L A H N A T U R N E R, and also on Twitter at Lana Turner. And I'm bringing it out because uh, you're going to want to go to her website to see more about this documentary. This documentary is profound. Tell Thank us about you. it. Yeah, we <laughs> talked about it a little last time. You were doing a, you were doing a crowdsourcing for it last yes. time you were here. And I didn't fully get what you were doing. <laughs> uh, I had an idea what you were doing, but now I've seen what you've done. And it's. I mean, we're going to show you some footage in just a minute. You're going to see exactly. It's going to take your breath away. I, I'm getting emotional just thinking oh. about what I've seen. So, well, thank you. So what is this? What have you done? All right. So it is confusing because when I came back on before, we were actually crowdsourcing for the one-hour special. So there was two projects. When um, my husband, Rafi May, um, well, we have to rewind, rewind four years ago because um, I wanted to do a documentary to help him lose weight. Um, and if we go back even more years before that, we he and I were always approached for doing reality shows. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. That's interesting. We shot two, and some of that footage is in the documentary because oh, we interesting. have footage that went back to like 20 years ago when we first got together. Goodness sakes. And, uh, but, every, but I didn't like the experience of having somebody else filming us. And, well, especially uh, the producers going, can't you do this? Can't you do that? Ralphie said, said this. Ralphie said that. Well, oh. the one, one of the documentaries that, or one of the, it wasn't really the one was more of a documentary than a reality show. The other was a reality show, and that I just really didn't like. But neither one of them ended up getting picked up. But every six months, because of our size difference and because we're both comedians, we got approached to do reality. Well, let me talk about Alana's comedy first. Okay. So you can find uh, Alana's an actress. She's a comedian. She's a singer. And she, as we said, she was married to Ralphie May. The documentary is. Uh, oh wait a minute. Love You, Ralphie, a stand-up comedy special? Is that a different that's thing? That's the stand-up special. So that's where the confusion is. Okay. So okay. The well, docu- I want to get your stuff okay. out first. Where can people find out where you're performing? Um, my website, okay. lanaturner.com, and then I pu- pu- promote on okay. social media. And so the, the stand-up comedy special mm-hmm. is what we were raising money for Love last time. Love You, Ralphie. Love You, Ralphie. So, yeah, we filmed a documentary of him four years ago. Well, maybe more now. It's been the, – all the years and time, like, starts to yeah. blend together. But um, – but yeah, he wanted to do a reality show back then, and I was like, no way. So we hired Kat Reinhardt, who is a friend of ours, bought a camera and put her on the road with him, and she shot a lot of his stand-up. But it was also meant to be this other project that, I mean, I knew back then, I was like, dude, you got to get this weight off your body. You're not going to be around much longer. And uh, and that was the other documentary, and like any good film like that, it doesn't end where you want it to. And it's that's a, why it's, it's a good story. It's verite. It's, it's really what happened. It's, yeah. And, and it got – well, let's, let's take it slow because it, it goes – I think most people know Ralphie's no longer with us. And it, it, it goes through all that. It goes to that place and beyond. Yeah. Um, well, that – so the confusion about Love You, Ralphie, the, the documentary is actually called What's Eating Ralphie May, which – um, you know, I didn't love the title. I and love it. I I, love I'm it. so glad you do. I because love it. I think it's it's the only it's the only title. It's, it's, <laughs> only, it's the only title. It has to be this title. Well, the beautiful thing about that that I don't like it is that I also had I gave up all control of the edit of the film because while it was supposed to be a film about Ralphie and that was the project that that I started, it ended up being a lot about me as well, and so I didn't, and the kids too much about the kids well um but yes the kids are a huge part of the film and uh i say too much because they don't you know they they're young and their participation in this is going to change their lives a little bit probably but, i mean they're they're going to grow up and they won't be recognizable as those kids one right, day, right? right. And, and even probably now frankly i mean right. that, that's that's most of that was two three years ago yeah they've yeah. they've doubled in size yeah right <laughs> uh, and, and do you ever talk to them about consent? I mean, are they comfortable with it? Do you ever discuss it with them? Yeah, well, yeah, but they're little. I they mean, they don't really know what it all means. Yeah, yeah, um, but it could be worse. They could be Bert Kreischer's kids. <laughs> 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 because, because trust me, it's worse. I just ran <laughs> into them at the at the roller rink. Oh, that's yeah, too funny. Just randomly, that's too funny. But um, yeah, I mean, look, 
this project, uh, when Rafi passed, his finances were not in good shape. Mm -hmm. So this is helping them stay in their lives and in their school. And um, as a parent, I'm, I'm making the choice that I want them to be able to not have to leave their home and there's, you know, and it's a difficult choice, but it, it, I think it's the right one for them in the long run. I'm having a bit of a, a Rorschach experience. There's a lot I want to get into. I'm having this sort of, because <laughs> I, I watched the the uh, sizzle, which we're going to show you in just a second. I had an emotional reaction to that. And I'm having a flashback to <laughs> me walking with a friend down the Las Vegas Strip and going, oh, my God, Ralphie's is, is, uh, got a residency at the Bally's. I have to go. We, we literally found our way to a stage manager and – bum rushed the whole operation in the middle of the day so we could get in to see him and he was very kind and we saw him backstage afterwards I saw him at the casino afterwards he was not gambling he was not drinking he was not doing anything he just going home and um, he was his gracious self and he was his freaking hysterical self on the stage and I thought oh my god he does this night after night and he just delivers like that every night he destroys destroys yeah. Yeah, he was a force. <laughs> I, I also saw him. Okay, I'm just going to go with my emotions in this because I'm having all this flood of feeling about him because I really, I really was an admirer. I saw him at the. You may remember this night at the uh, Shrine Auditorium. K Rock had a April Foolishness, and it was full. Like this is like three couple thousand people, right? And he had that audience. I've never seen anything like it. The waves were going. Like people were like, what? like what? But it was going through the audience like waves. Could could you see that? Did you stand backstage or anything? And see, oh, or yeah. Have you seen that before? Oh yeah. yeah. I've never seen anything like that in my life. And because I, I was out on the side and I could see these, just it was like human energy. <laughs> it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And you both came on uh, Love Line that night or the next night. Oh, you yeah, remember? I remember yeah. that. Yeah. And I never, I don't think I'd ever met you before. That was the mm -hmm. first time I met you. And I brought it up to him and he goes, he goes, yeah, it's crazy, man. <laughs> He's like, that's crazy, right? <laughs> and I go, yes. It was like, not, did you remember that? Do you remember yeah, seeing that? I do. It was like, I, maybe my memory is more vivid than the reality, but I was like, oh my God, he's destroying this audience, but not like everybody dying. It's like, it was, it was in waves. Yeah. I've never seen anything like that. He was amazing. Yeah, amazing. And, and I, then I saw him in, in, in Las Vegas where he's doing the same thing every night. It was different. Mm -hmm. It was different, but it destroying still. Just, yeah. uh, just a force to reckon with. Yeah, he was Where did super that come talented. From? Where did that come from? What do you mean? Where did that come from? His well, ability to was that control God, just an God audience? given. Was that just? Did he know? Did he think about it? Did he talk about it? Um, he. I mean, look, he did stand up for so many years. Like, so I feel like stand up's one of those things that if you do all, it all the time, you get better and better at it. But he yeah. was, he was very, unique. very good. Yeah. He could command a room. But but it was storytelling, and it was yes. it was little. It was almost Richard Pryor poetry stuff. Yeah. You know, and yeah. He was he was definitely. Like, I mean, look, he was an amazingly talented comic. But he, did he talk about it, what he was doing? Did he have a philosophy he was following? Or just... He had certain things that he did on stage to encourage an audience. I mean, like just one really small thing is if he's got the audience in a really good place where he knows that he might be able to get a standing O, he started to do like this towards the end of his act. So he could like encourage people like so as like part priming, of his priming. motion, but it's a subtle thing. It's a priming. It's called yeah. it's priming the audience. Yeah, so like little things psychologically that yeah. you can do in front of a crowd huh. that kind of gets them to give you the reaction that you want. Oh, that's interesting. He had a few tricks like, like that. What else? Give us more. Oh my gosh, um, I'm trying like to get. I mean, just okay. Well, performing left, right, center, punch, left, right, center. Be oh, able to get the crowd, so you sweep the crowd, making eye contact, talking to your best friend in the back of the room, so everyone feels like they're connecting with you. That's very interesting. Yeah, things... that's good for public speaking, I would think too. Not yeah, just, not just comedy. Yeah, you... and being relaxed on stage, walking up there. Also, the moment you walk on stage, just knowing that you're going to connect with this crowd, they're giving the audience the comfort to know that you're there. You know, if you, there's different ways that you can walk out on stage, right? The moment you walk out, you're you're the person that they're here to see you're the headliner you're the you're the dominant one yeah and then you, he was great about just just me and he was look i mean he was massive <laughs> and um and captivating and incredibly charismatic which you know i mean i met ralphie seven years before he got his notoriety and he was no lie he was like 800 pounds and broke and i fell in love with him and I never thought I would, but he was very, very charismatic. And now, you make a comment in the documentary about yourself being that person who took this on. Hmm. What do you want to say about that? <laughs> Which part? <laughs> that I, that I well, chose you, that? Well, you said it. You said, what's up with me that I chose this? 
Yeah, but you don't answer it. So now in reflection? Yeah. Like, why did I choose this Just situation? What, you know, I'm not even sure I want anything that specific. What are your feelings on it now? Gosh, I mean, I, I naivety, maybe. I mean, look, I, I loved somebody. I say it in the film. I love somebody who's very sick, and so maybe... I'm sick as well. You say that. I yes. know. You say that specifically. Yeah. Do you, do you feel that's true? Yeah. And, and when you say you're sick, what does that mean? Um, codependent, maybe. Did um, you have, and, and feel free not to answer any of my questions. <laughs> I, mean, but, I won't. I'll just sit here and won't answer anything. <laughs> we'll just go. I, I'm not comfortable <laughs> no, or whatever. No, but did you over. have an addict alcoholic parent? No. Hmm. No, but there was some substance abuse in my family. Like my grandmother was, I mean, she, she would... Um, take Valium and wash them down with alcohol. Good and times. There was a lot of emotional good, stuff good there. And, and was she your main caregiver? No. No, but that funnels down into everything. Right. Um, and so there was other things for, for me in my life. Some that, trauma. Yeah, I'm sure of it. I mean, look, you don't start comedy for because you're have you know, you make light of stuff that's sad. In fact, like when Rafi left me, like it became this huge flood of comedy for me. I just started writing a ton of stuff. And even now being able to talk about his loss on stage and I mean it just made for amazing stand up which you know they say tragedy equals comedy I think Ralphie had a very tragic life that made him very funny and I, I think a lot of mo- every comic I know is jacked up so yeah I, I that after dark show I do I just I, I should bring you on that too we just interview comics about their lives and, and the each you know it's almost like uh, Tolstoy that said you know every happy family is the same but every Dysfunctional family is dysfunctional in its own way. Comedians are that. Each they all have trauma. They all have tragedy. They all have stuff. Each one different. Yeah, <laughs> and not one sort of vein that go. Oh, that's going to be a comedian. And a lot of substance abuse. A lot of substance abuse, both in their families and in themselves. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But not, but not exclusively. So I can't say you know because you're a comedian, you're going to be a right. drug addict, alcoholic. It's just there is a lot of it there, and some of it's the the lifestyle, being on the road all the time, and clubs and stuff. Yeah, not just accessibility. It's like people are buying your drinks, and you're yeah. it's just you're just that's just where you are. Yeah, I, I'm. I I very rarely do anything, but when I go and perform, like people will put joints in my pockets and right. stuff, and I'm just like, I am so straight laced. I have to be up in the morning. I got a kid, so I like at six a.m. I'm up. Like, right. So yeah, but um, but I took on something with Ralphie that I I'm extremely optimistic even now. Like I feel like I can turn the craziest thing into oh I'll find the positive side of this. And so when Ralphie entered my life and or when I entered his, I just, he asked me to help him. And I, I loved him dearly and I never gave up on it. And really way past the point of, to which, and that was a disservice to myself. And that's, and watching the film and seeing that makes, and how sad I was, makes me really sad for, for us all. You started late in the documentary talking about codependency. Early on, you don't talk about it that way. So I'm guessing either you had some therapy or went to Al-Anon or something. I started during this process of looking at myself. Um, turning the camera on him made me start to reflect on, on myself. And seeing the process, just it, he was never going to do it. And I don't know why. I mean, there in my mind, there was no options because I knew he... I knew the other outcome was what happened was he was going to die. Right. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't an option. You're not going to die. You're going to get better. You're going to find your way through this. Well, he wasn't going to. And, um, and then I started to realize that, you know, and, and look, it wasn't just food for him. We went through seven years of, of rehabs and hospitalizations. He was in and out during that time, every four to six months. Um, I think there was 11 hospitalizations and rehab stints for, for, um, well, so he had pulmonary embolisms and he was always a huge pot smoker and obviously food addict, but he got on prescription pain pills. And, um, I didn't even realize how bad it was until we checked him into one of these posh rehabs, which he didn't want to go, um, which it didn't work. It was very expensive. And, um, I, I, in hindsight, you know, you have to really want to get sober yourself. You can't do it for anyone else. And so that's the piece you had left out. 
Yeah. That's the codependent wasn't seeing that. Right? I was not seeing it. Not at all. So I forced that, this. That's what this doc shows. Yeah. And and um, when you go around and talk about the documentary, I hope you'll speak to that because there are lots of code, I'm a codependent. There's lots of codependents out there, right? And it, that experience and what it was like and what you should have done, what you might have done, what you do now, that kind of stuff is, I think would be very important for people. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I wasn't. I wasn't in a good place. I was constantly trying to bring this person to sobriety because, you know, they, I've talked to so many people now, the stories end kind of the same. So, um, but I didn't know when I was in it. And then when I did start going to Al-Anon, he actually got upset. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, it's that interesting because that they, they you do they do react when you start. He got going angry on. because why are you going? He doesn't have a problem, right? I, and so and then he was very worried. I never spoke. I just sat and listened. Um, but he was very worried that I would I would talk about uh, about my experiences, and I I never felt comfortable talking about it there. I I can do it on stage in front of an audience, but not. I I just wanted to listen to other people's stories, and I actually had a hard time with Alan. On to be honest, I I. I have a hard time with the higher power mm-hmm. part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I really wish I didn't. I wish I could find that. But but then I, I started with therapy, and I went every week, and I still go. Um, I, I go to the Maple Center. Oh, they're great. They're wonderful. Yeah, I, I got honored by them one time. Did you? Yeah, they're fabulous. They're, they're so they, good. We should uh, put up a little ad for them or something because it's a f- yeah. reduced fee. They'll, they'll treat anybody. They're excellent. Yeah, excellent, a percentage excellent. of the proceeds were like <clears throat> from – well, we definitely – I haven't figured out what we're doing with the documentary, but that was part of the one-hour special was to help support them too. Them and um, Our House Grief Support was another really great place. I actually didn't go there, but my kids did, my daughter, and they went to Camp Aaron, which is another great organization that helps for children who've lost a parent or a sibling. They can go to camp, and it's, I, I have, I've had a lot of help with a lot of different resources, but therapy was really good. It gave me a lot of ability to self-reflect and figure out – you know what my role was in it, and I still find it really confusing. Yeah, I bet it's, it's so confusing. But but I, I well, I'm wondering not so much what your role was in it because it's it's the usual. It's just the way addiction is. You know, it's just they it take it sucks everybody in and uses us. That's what mm-hmm. it, it sucks the person in the people around them. That's what addiction does. But I'm wondering what he was for you. What do I don't you mean? I don't know. I just what what that was for you. I know what you were for him in terms of both in terms of you as uh, he told me by the way how much he loved you and stuff back mm-hmm. when I first met him, but I also know who he was for you as a, you were for him as a codependent, enabler, whatever. It just I know what that is. You huh. know what I mean? But I'm wondering what he was for you. Interesting. I don't know. It, I I love to hear you say how much he loved me cuz the hardest part for me at the end of his life he did not love me. Well, it's so that all right, was let's, really let's, sad. <laughs> let's let's roll the documentary okay. sizzle because it's breathtaking. Yeah. Uh, and in, 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 what you will hear him talking is towards later, right? When he's feeling like a monster. It's at towards the very end of the shoot. You mean he, he would, the, this part where he starts to feel like a monster? That to me is a very important zone that he put himself in. You didn't put him in that. He put himself in. Oh that. yeah. So yeah, here, he, a lot of self loathing, right? Yeah. Here is the sizzle. I'm sick of feeling like a monster. I'm sick of feeling like a monster all the time. I'm sick of walking down the street and people look at me like I'm a monster. I'm sick of living in Los Angeles, feeling like a monster. New York, like a monster. In my marriage, like a monster. first met him, I thought, this is a simple fix. Two and a half pounds a week, right? How many years ago was that? 16 years. I'm tired. I'm tired. I just want a happy ending. You tell my story, be honest. Good and bad. Oh, it's breathtaking. It is just breathtaking. <laughs> and it's so honest and so uh, intense. And, God, there's so much to talk about with this. Um, please go see it. Well, tell us where it's coming up. Well, um, we don't know yet. But, <laughs> That's but why this Na- is a little premature. Nashville. But we, we have the Nashville um, premiere, uh, which is 
true. It's crazy that that's where we're premiering. It's actually on October 7th, which was chosen because it's the uh, it's the two-year anniversary of his passing um, on the 6th. So I'm actually, there's so many to say. Um, I'm, I'm actually, the kids haven't seen his grave. So they're going to come with me first to Arkansas to see his grave because I couldn't afford to take them. That's how that's a whole nother story, but, um, and so we'll premiere on the seventh and there's another showing on the eighth. And then like a week and a half later, then we'll have another showing here in Los Angeles at doc fest LA. Okay. We, we're going to go, we got to go to that. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure we're there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it'll be, it'll be a good show here. And so it'll have its West coast premiere. And then, um, hopefully we'll find a buyer and it'll end up on some sort of streaming platform or I don't know yet. We, I haven't even gotten that far. This is, I've been learning as, as we've been going yeah, through this. It's, it's, um, an important project. Uh, so I, I gotta, again, I always have this Rorschach experience when I think about his stuff and your, and your documentary, um, the monster piece. What do you think that was? So it's a very vivid feeling he had about being a monster. Well, I mean, to be in the film, there's a scene where he's like screaming at me on a bus and the children are in the car. Um, I mean, he was kind of a monster that night, like to be honest. And that was on. So it sounds awful to say that about a person who's deceased and, and you haven't seen the film for the people who haven't seen it. But yeah. like, basically you get this glimpse into I, I mean, I just, I just saw a drug addict. I just, you know, drug was, addicts will get, they'll explode and stuff. That's the way it goes. Well, but, but what's interesting to me is that the more, I think he thought of himself as a monster most of his life. Yes, I would agree with uh, that. Uh, and, and I think he lived with that quietly. I, I bet he never said it to you, right? Early? Did he say it early on? Well, he definitely self-loathed because he... Even early. I mean... Did he ever tell, say to me that he did felt you, like you, a monster? That monster just thinks that monster feeling just seems so vivid to me, and it's so so honest an expression of what he felt. So I'm guessing. I wish I could talk to him. Jesus, mm-hmm. I wish I could talk to him. Mm-hmm. That he's he felt because he was monstrous, right? And he talked about walking down the street and being looked at as a monster and a monster, a monster. He 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 made himself into a monster. That's what he that's what he became. But that was comfortable for him. I think he kind of liked that to a certain extent because when we have people lose massive amounts of weight, they feel exposed. They they don't like it. They usually they like the protection of of being have the big body around them. It's a very common feeling, but but I but I think when you pushed him to change, and particularly when those monstrous emotions emerge. Then he really, literally, he now he connected with the monster emotionally. Like I'm, a, I'm, a, I am, a, I am. I'm not just monstrous, and you know that kind of probably felt almost comfortable to him. But when the monstrous emotions and the feelings of brokenness sort of started coming in, as you as you appropriately pushed him, and I'm sure his treatment team pushed him to get better, it all became one metaphor of horrible. Um, Is that about right? I. I probably you're you're more experienced with it than I am. I I do think that I pushed him too hard. Like when somebody doesn't want to get better, but I don't. I don't. I, I can't think about it that way. I, you were just doing what you were doing. Yeah. But it's interesting to me that when his back was against the wall, which is where you got him, mm-hmm. and that's you know cause you were trying to save his life. All right. Uh, <laughs> that's when he felt like a monster. Very. It's just very. I God. I wish I could talk to him. Uh, I would say it's this. unusual. That's an unusual set of feelings to have at that at that point when the camera stopped rolling and the documentary ends you know you come back and you see me again and this is a few this is a year and a half later after she shot stopped shooting and then came back and saw me and the kids yeah um that year and a half i he was a monster to me like it was awful like a lot of people think that i filed for divorce I didn't, I didn't have the courage. I never would have. I never would have left him. I'm going to cry. Um, I would hate even talk. I mean, it makes me feel so sad. He, he did things in the course of the divorce and, and then in the six month window where we tried to get back together that just made sure that I wouldn't want to be with him ever again. Like that last year, I, we didn't even, I couldn't talk to him. Like it was, it was bad. 
Because he so, would become abusive or aggressive or yeah, all of the above? Yeah. I mean, and I, I have a hard time. Like, we had 17 years together. And, yes, there were bumps. It was a marriage that was bumpy. And I talk about the seven years that we came in and out of rehab. Those were hard years. But for me to fall in love with him, you know, like the physicality and everything else, I, I adored him. So to see that person... And I, I attribute it to this to the disease addiction. And, yeah, I just see I just hear an addiction story when you tell me this story. I mean, it's right. it's not none of the behavior is okay, mm-hmm. but it's addiction straight out. the The divorce was beyond brutal, and for a man that knew that he was going to pass, like to leave things in such shambles for his kids, and and then the people who surrounded him at the end of his life, and all of that was just like unbelievable to me because he had like he even says. At, at, well, Kat, when she started filming, she's like, I want to see if you can really have everything. Because I feel like Ralphie had everything that he could have ever dreamt of having in his life, especially where he started his life and where he ended. Like he had, we had built this career. Like I helped him so much and I, I loved him, his success. I love doing stand up. I want, I want to be able to perform in fr- everywhere in the world. And I've been very blessed um, but I was also really excited to be able to watch his career grow and raise children and still be able to get on stage. That to me was a great recipe. But for him, he wanted to be in the light and he got to and he got to be wealthy from it. And and to just like destroy all of that blew my mind. It still does. How did he destroy it? He destroyed his marriage. He No, I mean, the, he, did he gamble away money or what did he? The end of, there was... The exact figure in his bank account, I, I'm going to get it wrong. It was like $286 and something cents. It was, that was all that was left in his bank account when he passed. Like, Did he have a gambling problem too? No. no. Well, I mean, he liked to gamble. He, here's the thing, and it's a wonderful quality, but Ralphie didn't do anything with subtlety, right? Everything was big. Monstrous. Bit monstrous. There's the monster for you. I, and, I know. And it's fun. So early on in our relationship, we were broke. We lived in, literally, he talked about living in DA hood, the hood. We lived in DA hood together, but we never didn't have enough to have fun. Like we could, and it was always over the top. Um, so the good things were, were over the top, but then the bad things became over the top. And at the end of his life, I mean, he had people in his life he he always was very generous but i mean if he had something in his pocket he was giving it to those people that were around him and they were happy to supply him and um he had like for he had this briefly had a girlfriend come into his life and i got to see how much money he spent trying to keep that going i mean like i think he spent like 50 grand on that girl she was like just craziness and and he's gone within a year and a half like he had kids and it's just we're doing okay. Like we're doing okay, and I'm I'm really proud of how well I've been able to get through this, and I'm I'm happy too, which is important to note. But I, yeah, I, I want I want to also point really out the, doc, the documentary is not really sad; it's bittersweet. It, it's it's it, we're we're talking about sad stuff now because it's the first time I really talked to you in depth about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be a comic. <laughs> yeah, it, I'm know, really funny no, on stage. <laughs> no, but it, it's true. You are. Uh, she does songs. She plays guitar. Yeah, uh, but but it, it it is. I just think. Let's, let's get into it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's take a little break, and we'll talk about how the kids are doing after the break. Okay. okay. Well, of course, I get lots of questions about CBD products, but thanks to all those claims being made, uh, people are terribly confused. And it's difficult to answer some of these questions with certainty. The clinical science is not quite there yet, but certainly the anecdotes are coming in. And I've connected with an Oregon-based company that is all about high-quality ingredients and manufacturing standards, not hype. Previously, they were called Select CBD, but they've just relaunched their brand as Social CBD. Social CBD focuses on broad-spectrum oil, something else you might have heard about but may be equally confused. So let's start with that. Hemp has over 60 non-psychoactive cannabinoids, and CBD is just one of them. Broad-spectrum oil goes beyond CBD isolate, contains additional active compounds that can work with the CBD to create what is known as the entourage effect. This can more effectively deliver some of the calming or relaxing effects that many people are looking for or experiencing. Social CBD's broad-spectrum oils contain zero CBD, so there's no rewarding effect. They're available as great-tasting tinctures in great flavors like vanilla mint, pomegranate tea, Meyer lemon. Simply drop it under your tongue for maximum effect. Social CBD products are in a range of formulations, each of which is clearly described, so you can make an informed decision without all the promises that sound too good to be true. To learn more, go to drdrew.com slash socialcbd, that is our site, 
drdrew.com slash S-O-C-I-A-L-C-B-D. And for a limited time, you can save 20% at checkout with the code Dr. Drew, D-R-D-R-E-W. So it's drdrew.com slash social CBD, and then Dr. Drew at checkout. Hey, I want to talk to everyone about a subject that uh, gets a lot of negative press. Of course, that's ED, erectile dysfunction. Even the way some of the companies that offer ED solutions, they tend to talk about the condition that make people feel as though it's something they should be embarrassed about. Truth is, 30 million men are affected by some form of ED, the majority of cases, uh, beyond their control. It's biological, lots of different reasons. Men, as they age, typically get something like this. And uh, in every case of ED, it affects two people, of course, the man and his or her, his or her partner. The stress and strain that put on relationships can be problematic. And we all know the pharmaceutical options are out there. They've been helping for like 20 years plus now, and there's online options. But uh, some people, you know, don't want to use medication. Sometimes this is a temporary problem. Sometimes they're not effective. And that is where Gaines Wave may be a great option. Gaines Wave is a breakthrough shockwave-based treatment that addresses what is at the root of erectile dysfunction, which is a buildup of arterial microplaque in the arteries in the penis. The buildup can be severely impeding to the blood flow necessary for a sustained erection. The Gaines Wave treatment uses sound waves to break up the microplaque and improve or restore blood flow. It is a non-invasive, drug-free option that is very promising. The procedure just takes 20 minutes. Most men are able to enjoy the benefits the same day. Great part is it's non-pharmaceutical, and the best part is Gaines Wave reports a 75% success rate, which is truly impressive. If you think you or your partner could benefit from this treatment, check it out. There are over 400 Gaines Wave providers in North America. To learn more, just go to drdrew.com slash wave. That is drdrew.com slash wave today. It is Gaines Wave, G-A-I-N-S-W-A-V-E. Check it out. All right, welcome back. We're talking, of course, Lana Turner, lanaturner.com, at Lana Turner on Twitter. The the documentary is What's Eating Ralphie May is going to be in Nashville on October 7th. October 7th. And in Los Angeles at the Doc Fest. We Which don't know is yet. like mid-October. Mid-October. Uh, we'll both be at that. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll do everything in my power to get there. What time of day do you think that'll be? I have no idea yeah, yet. Yeah, I don't either know. I just All announced right. our acceptance. All right, but, so. I, but I can't. That's great. Yeah. Well, congratulations. <laughs> how, how are people receiving the Doc? Are they? Um, so far, everyone well, blows their mind. It's not what anyone would expect. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's not typical that somebody who was famous would allow this kind of access. And then, I mean, we talked about it before. A lot of times when a celebrity passes, they'll do a bio doc yeah. where like Robin Williams is an amazing documentary, but it's tracing his life through other people's words and then assembling footage together to make that story kind of come to life. That's not what this is. This, this is verite. Is, this is the truth. <laughs> this is an actual film that was shot while he was alive and he literally... It's almost a docu-reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, it's a follow-on. So and, people... And, and shit went down. <laughs> yeah. So you ask how people react. You should answer that question because... Well, you... I, it takes my breath away. I, yeah. I, 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 have, all, I, wanna, I have all kinds of feelings. Uh, the, that sizzle I can't barely watch. Mm. Uh, the documentary fortunately has ups and downs and I get enough of, I, I end up, I, I think I've told you honestly, I end up wanting more of Ralphie comedy. So when the, when our comedy special comes out, I'm going to be <laughs> running to that, running to that because I want more of that Ralphie when, when I'm done. But I'm, I'm, yeah, it's breathtaking to see what he was contending with. And, and um, there's something – we're going to figure out, you and I, more about this monster metaphor and, or maybe talk to other people who felt that way. And there, there's something unique about that feeling that uh, – I don't know. It, it's, it's to tell. It's a human thing that we don't often talk about. And and he does become monstrous in a lot of ways, uh, but addiction makes everybody monsters. It just does. That's what addiction does, and that's why people think addicts are bad people because they do some such monstrous things. That's the addiction. So you know when people do horrible stuff, I don't want to dismiss it. They have to take the consequences like anything else for their disease. Could have gotten, could have lost the weight, could have gotten better sooner. He didn't do that, right? So it's on him where it went. But the actuality of what they do, it's it's because of the disease. So how are the kids? They're good. Before, I just I was going to say, and I'll, I hope that the film helps people. 
because like what you were saying, if this is a common this is a common thread, yeah, and it already has. I have a few people who saw the film. One of my friends that came, he, he immediately stopped eating sugar because he said he like he's totally dependent on sugar, and um, I think it does have a positive impact. But um, it, I hope it, so. it, it, it's it's not. It's going to be different than you think. I think it's not going to be about addiction so much where its impact's going to be. Co- codependency. Well, codependency <laughs> yeah. will be about that. <laughs> Maybe so. Codependence will get something out of this. Yeah. But but I I see it as something more than more. I don't know. We're gonna find out when people see it. So the kids. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the kids. How are they doing? Because um, kids. Because one version of what I was experiencing in the documentary was through the kids' eyes. Hmm. I was I was experiencing it through them. I was experiencing it through you. I was. I, there were like three points of view I had in the documentary. It's me as a fan. You as a wife, and then the kids and what they were seeing and experiencing. Oh, I'd love to hear what you feel they were. I mean, I worry about them all the I mean, time. They, and... I'm sure they had some trauma, right? Yeah. Uh, but they, it's like every child of an addict, they, they just want their mom and dad to be okay. That's what they want. And and they, they in some respect, feel responsible for what's happening always. But it, you, with what you're doing with them, with the camps, that they're, they, you get them through that pretty easily. I hope so. Yeah. Um, so they've been in therapy consistently for like three years now. Um, and then they're thankfully I, I was really scared there for a while that we were going to lose our house and that they weren't going to be able to stay in their school. So I was able to keep it consistent for them, at least in their environment and their friend base, um, which was great. Cause we have a really nice community of, of people in our lives that absolutely have been there for us the last few years um so they're doing pretty good i mean they're they're happy how old are they now um april just turned 12 and august just turned 10 oh boy you're, he- you're heading <laughs> into it get, get, <laughs> getting the team thing going yeah the, and, but the therapy will really really help it, it yields dividends it just does I, yeah. i've seen them both be amazingly like are they just, at maple center too yeah oh fantastic yeah they they are and they love it they've been really good at first i had to like you know, convince them that this was going to be the greatest place on the planet. It's going to be so much fun. And then they, they're, they're sucked in, but it's, it's really good. And then our house, the grief support, there there was two, there's two things that happened to them. One, they, they lost a father that they didn't have. He wasn't an involved parent for years leading up to, to him. Then, then he left the marriage and the divorce was really hard for them because he would no show all the time. Like there was, there was crazy stuff that went on during that year and a half. He would come to LA and he would make an appointment to see them and they would wait for him and he just wouldn't show up. And it happened over and over and over again. So then they got to feel this like rejection. But so. I, I will tell you what's going on with him though. What, what's going on with him is he's using and he feels ashamed mm-hmm. and he can't face up to that. Without a doubt. I mean, he, it was really sad, but it's, you know, to see these little kids, it just, it's so sad. I'm, I just, and, and then, and then the blame of that he would put on to me, like I, he used to tell people that I kept him from his kids all the time. And I, I never kept him from his kids. Like there was a point in which I had to, we had to go to court to establish his visitation because he was making me crazy because he would say he was coming and then he wouldn't, and he would make an appointment to see them and then he wouldn't. So the judge had to give him a window to which he could. And then he still had a really hard time in that, in those guidelines. But yeah. It when, was... when he was acting monstrously, how would that, when you think about that time, how do you feel? I mean, the, it, like during like imagine imagine that time when he's acting monstrously whatever that means for you what are the feelings that come to mind for you what do you how do you experience yourself what are you feeling it oh, during all that i mean sad angry hurt crying like everything but eventually i Does, got to a place where i just severed like no i get you but I, I that was actually healthy stuff when you started doing that yeah I, it, it felt better because yeah. i could take control back in the but I'm I'm having an experience uh, I want to share with you that I that when I see you talking about those monstrous times I don't know what else to call them but we're just using his metaphor the word small comes to my mind. Okay, does that, that mean for anything me to, to you? feel small? Yeah. I mean, I just don't. I I it was it's really hard for me to understand why it would have gone 
down that road. And when you explain it, it's just addiction and it's the disease, then I understand it. But, you know, when you love somebody and you give them all those years of your life and children and, and then they just treat you like yeah, that, it's, you, it's not okay. it, you feel it's, awful. Yeah, it's like, awful. It's not okay. So yeah. every emotion. And, I, and I've had women and other people talk to me that so i know it's a common experience yeah yeah it's um, nothing i want to be very clear nothing okay about it yeah but it's alcohol it's addiction it's yeah. you know it's how that works and ralphie was so loved and that's the other part like he you saw him in vegas like he was amazing and he was so sweet to everyone yep. so he was great so, to us so i don't want to like focus on him being oh, no, mean uh, to me or whatever because oh, but the, why would but, i say the word small why does that come to my head because he was so big and did that make you feel small that he was so big. I mean, did you did was it? Did you feel little and small and scared when he would get like that? I was that? terrified for so many reasons. I mean, like, look, he he wanted he was really angry at me, Drew, and I I all I did was try and help him. And now I understand, like, I was he was hating himself, and I was the person that he could take that out on. But I mean, he really took it out on me at the end. So, um, that's not in the dock, <laughs> but it, it's, it's in, it's, it's in a, a somewhat public space because he did it publicly. Like, I mean, he, fi- he filed in the film, you'll see that. And then he unfiled and we had like six months and then he, f- he filed again. And I was like, file on me once, mm, but twice, that's it. Right. I mean, it took two filings for me to go, okay, our marriage is really over. And then. And then I, I I wanted to like consciously uncouple. I was I literally said to him, "I go, let's be Gwyneth Paltrow, <laughs> like <laughs> let's let's do this nicely." And um, and he ended up filing like this junction. Like he didn't want me to um to file. It's a, called a, a request for order. That's like a protective order. So he'd filed in Tennessee because we had our second home there. But the kids and we were really in California it's just because he's on the road. The business was there, so we had this like jurisdictional issue and he did this injunction that made it impossible for me to appeal to any state hmm. and then it also gave me no protection so in that year and a half he emptied my bank account so I had no finance for a year and a half for the kids or myself and there was no 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 state that I could appeal to I just had to sit there and and wait it out until finally it we started to move forward and then he passed but that year and a half was just, I mean, I, I would get work, Drew, and then he, through his manager, a guy that wasn't really a manager, would get me fired from work. Like, he would call the club and be like, if she works there, I'm not working there. Well, they're going to let me go. So I couldn't even generate income hardly. So I just had to sit there and, and like, and again, I loved him. So to have those things go down at the end of his life, I was just, like, it, it's just a beyond me. And it's not, and we're talking about all this stuff. I think it's going to infuriate people because they're going to hear this without seeing the film and see how much I cared for him, which you see in the film. But <laughs> I don't, I don't think it's going to infuriate people. <laughs> no, I'm no, talking I, about I'm, somebody I'm more, who passed away. And, oh no, I'm more worried they're going to be angry with him, not oh. you. Be- because, well, he doesn't get his chance to, to talk from yeah, his side right yeah, now. Like he doesn't that... get to say, look, she did this or that. I, I I don't know what he would say. What his experience was. Like, I, the only thing, so like, um, after he'd emptied my bank accounts, after he left the marriage, after he was getting me fired from work, I released a visual album called Limeade, which was my journey through the divorce experience. And it's on my YouTube channel. It's a bunch of videos. And I think it pissed him off. Um, But it's funny and it's comedy and it was a tribute to my experience. And that's how I deal with life and as through laughter and Um, so that would be the only thing he could say, well, you really pushed my buttons with that one. But then he talked about me on stage and did jokes. So like, it was all fair game. I I don't, I think that, um, that we had 17 good years together and the last few were crap. (laughs) Yeah. And and you're, you're talking very honestly and in great detail about how, how dark and bad it gets. I just hear addiction, addiction, addiction. That's all I hear is that the story of addiction and where it takes people and it sucks everyone in. I, I, I watching the documentary, you get certainly a flavor for the struggle and, and the good years. And, and, and you actually come away with a sense of him as a connected father, too, even though he's away a lot. You, you feel like, or the kids are at least connected with him, or they love him deeply and, you know, want him to be okay. And, you know, like every, like I've said, every child with an addict parent, that's sort of how they, how they Back feel. Back to the kids, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I worry about them. Yeah, but you're doing the right thing with them. Their treatment works, and 
it sounds like they're thriving and you know it's, it's a lot of kids live through a, a addicted parent history people repeat their parents issues like even Ralphie repeated like so he he didn't maybe we can talk you asked a little bit about him yes so um he his father left his mother when he was two years old and I I don't know so much about it but I think there was some substance abuse there I don't know a lot I just know from what Ralphie said so and a lot of things that Ralphie said had turned out not to be true from other people and his like his mother and I are still real close and mm. I'm really close to one of his sisters and so I mean I I don't always know if some of the stories that Ralphie told were completely accurate but I do know that the father left when he was two. Well, the gene has to come from somewhere. So the, and the mom doesn't gene. look like an alcoholic. Yeah, and so it's got to be the dad. So so when um when he left she, her she I don't know all the financial problems but she ended up having to move from a beautiful big house with her four children and Ralphie was two into poverty pretty much and raised these kids by herself and the father was affluent the father did very very well um, I got to see his house because Ralphie and he actually became friends one year Ralphie got on last comic standing his father reached out to him they had this relationship and then he died of um, he had skin cancer mm. was gone within a year mm. um, but when I talk about p- children repeating the issues of his parent of their parent, Rafi hated his father his entire life for and, abandoning him, and then did the same thing that his father did to That's his what, mother. This is exactly what people do, and it just blew my mind. He even got a t- tattoo of a chicken on his arm like a couple of years before because his father was in the poultry business, and I I didn't I was like, why are you honoring the man that like destroyed your childhood? I didn't understand that. Um, He's and, it's still his father. Still his father. And of course, you're going to always love your parent for something, but it, his father was absent from his life his entire life. Are your parents in your life? Yes. Yeah. And they've, Big time. They've been helping you and supporting you through this? Yeah. Um, they've been amazing. My, I, I, I'm, I love my parents, and yeah, they're my whole family, and they're coming to the premiere in Nashville. Have they seen it yet? Um, yeah, they've seen a rough cut. What'd they think? They're proud of me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, but like my whole family, my sister's coming, my aunt and uncle are coming. Like they're all very excited for this. Not, not for what it is because obviously nobody wanted this, but for the. And and by the way, this, it's a, it's a respectful homage to Ralphie, the documentary. So. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. I oh, feel no, no, it no, no, no. We're, we're talking about horrible stuff that, that where he took him, where they took him and stuff. That is not front and center in this documentary. No. Yeah, I, the, the, the struggle is front and center in the documentary. I think Kat did a great job of telling the story and keeping it it pretty neutral. Like, I, I mean, nobody wants to say anything. You, you could get you could get mad at you watching it because you want you want to go. Lana, ah, here's your codependency. It's your codependency. <laughs> Don't you see there. it? Yeah, not just get out of there, but get, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Turn back. It's like he's going to hate you for it. He's going to make, make him angry eventually, and then you see him start to turn. And get angry. So you and, actually and, see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you see I, the time. I, reach, I want to reach in there and pull me out of there when I watch mm. it. I really do. I'm like, I, and I, I, I. I actually didn't want you to be out. I wanted you to keep struggling on his behalf, even though I know he, how it ends. But I, he gave me no choice. <laughs> he actually gave me no choice. He said, you're done. And you know what? I Maybe initially, maybe I want, I sometimes want to believe that he did that because he was trying to help me. But I don't think so. Well, <laughs> I think that's me just trying to find a, like. Well, oh. What what was there a final straw of some type? For him? Yeah, with you. With me? Yeah. Wanting... What, what made him want to leave all of a sudden? Or what was that? He he said that when he first filed, it was an ultimatum. What was the ultimatum? I needed to leave L.A. But the crazy thing is, but you gave him an ultimatum. Back after that. Okay, so when he, before, so that when I left him in, in Wisconsin, because okay. he'd had, so he was oxycodone withdrawal. Yeah. He got super abusive. That, that yelling that she recorded on the bus was about a three hour yellathon where I just sat there and I thought there, he had weapons and stuff. So I was scared um, that he was going to hurt himself because he's had incidences of those in the past. There was one time he called me up on FaceTime and put a gun in his mouth. And there were like a lot of things that... In withdrawal? I don't know. That was a few years earlier. Yeah. Um, he spent four days in a psych ward. On a, He was a 72-hour mandatory hold, sure. which he well, ended up spending four days. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things leading up to that at the end. But um, but the thing in Wisconsin, I'd, 
I'd found he he was so sick on that bus. And then I found the empty bottle of oxycodone, which Kat witnessed but didn't record, which is why it's in a card where she says that and I confronted him, which started that that Tyree, abuse Tyree. of just yeah, and I was scared, really, really scared. And I took the kids and we flew home the next day. And I had a week in which I was in LA and he was in Nashville. And I knew he wanted me to come to Nashville. So I had a friend of mine a realtor come over and give me the value of our house for rent or for sale. And I had the book here. here. And he calls me and he's, and we're talking, we have a really sweet conversation. Kat actually recorded it. She's in the house. It's not in the film, but, um, in which I, he says to me, I want you to come to Nashville. And I said, well, I've already done this research knowing that that's how you felt. And, um, I'm willing to do it, but you have to get help. Like you have to get off this stuff and you got to lose weight. And I, cause I'm not, going to spend another year of my life and I I don't like Nashville but I'm married and we have a family and I'm willing to do what you want if you're willing to come to the plate um and it was a really sweet conversation and we got off the phone Kat turns off the camera she and I are talking and an email comes in my phone and it's a super weird like cryptic email about how I must not really love him and how like it's I, I don't even have the email I don't but it was like this just really, and Kat even read it and was like, that's really weird. And then she left. 30 minutes later, I got served with divorce papers. <laughs> so he knew the divorce papers were coming when he called me. And I was doing exactly what he wanted, which was, Very it confusing. was such a brain fog. Like, yes, it just, yes. So now I got served with divorce papers. And you see then April says in the film, mom's been upstairs crying all day. I just... I lost it. Like divorce wasn't an option in my mind for us. Like you get married, you sickness and in health, obviously he's sick. We're going to get through this one way or another. But, um, I got served with papers and I, I was, yeah, but we tried even after that. So we spent the next few months and then that was bad. It was really, really bad. Like at the very end, the last time we were ever intimate, like that was bad and he hurt me and like there's all this stuff and some of it became public because a year and a half later I had to file this request for order in California and they published this like thing in TMZ which was like part of this huge so because he (laughs) this is like a lot I don't know if you want to hear all this but okay so so when he filed in Tennessee and then I filed in California he there was this like window of time to which I had the opportunity to file this piece of paper in California but it it divorce is a nasty business and in the paper would outline all the different things that happened in the marriage. And you're supposed to put all this in writing. Your, your attorney requires it, right? Yeah. And in there is, Hey, he put a gun in his mouth. Hey, he did like, and it was pages of things of inappropriate behavior. And in there was this thing that he did the last time we slept together and he hurt me. And, um, I, so he called me up and was like, please don't file that paper. Let's, let's have an, a friendly separation. And I said, that's great. Like, I don't want to file this. And so that's when he filed his paper in Tennessee because I didn't file in California. So I spent that year and a half waiting for, um, for somewhere to go in which there was just like nonstop him having the upper hand and me not being able to get any finance or anything. And then I finally filed, like I got an attorney here who was willing to help me and she filed, um, a domestic abuse and, um, restraining order so he could stop sending all these nasty emails and get movement and that's when the judge came in and said you have this many days to visit and that and and so we finally had some structure yeah to to our lives and then but unfortunately they published in tmz like certain things that i never would have wanted to come public And And, and again these are progressive things that you're dealing with so it's natural that things got worse and worse and worse and worse if they're not getting better they're getting worse they don't stay the same they don't. I think everybody, when they go through, like, they, they deal with it in their own little bubbles. It just sucked that it became public. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, in such a... And now when I, like, see tabloids and I see things, I'm like, how did my life get in there? And then I read things about other people. I'm like, that's not true. <laughs> right. <laughs> they that, they are not listening. To, like, that, they're not seeing the whole picture. <laughs> that's, of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> that's, like, that's how fake news gets going. All, yeah. all you have to know how to, <clears throat> to understand how fake the news is out there, just become the object of, of the news. By, the, by the news. And you know immediately like, how fake it is. They, they vilified me. Like, I'm sepia-toned and, like, angry. And, <laughs> and, like, and, and just, like, really... <laughs> 
I know. So, um, well, I if if any, it, it's this is a very complicated story. Like, let's say I was treating Ralphie, I'd be like, "Oh boy, we got a lot of work on here." That's like a big complex psychiatric, medical, all these things going on. Not uncommon. It's not uncommon. I got to tell you, I sort of specialize in people like like Ralphie. And I think again, the doc is very fair to this. It doesn't it doesn't get into all the progression. That it's just not necessary. It's just to me, it's just all the progression of the disease of addiction, and it always goes to horrible places. And it always, especially with opiates, and it always kills people. It always does. Uh, if they don't get better, they die. The um, the one thing I'd love to like being the looking on the positive. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'd like to say for anyone who is dealing in the codependency that like yeah. it it gets better. Like it can get better. It, it can get better anytime. It, it, but you're in you're in as deep as the addict. Yeah. And so you too, much the way he was resisting, I'm sure you were resisting, and you have to like take your <laughs> disentangle and go take care of yourself. You have to take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. That's You started talking about that in the documentary. You start to see you start to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. I started to to try and take care of myself more you, but you and, but you was funny as i recall the scene but your next breath was and then we're going to get back to him and get him, get him <laughs> losing the weight get him on the treadmill it's like oh yeah i don't think so yeah <laughs> yeah i really it, and I, it wasn't just a fight with him anymore it became a fight with the people that were surrounding him too like when we're sitting at that kitchen table and they're all telling me that it's okay for him to sleep 22 out of 24 hours a day and that I'm just, or the guys that are like, I, I'm so stupid because I'm standing outside. We're talking about soda and I'm literally think he's only had a soda. And the guys are like, it's pouring out from behind the car and rolling under the tour bus because they have so much soda. They can't even carry it all. And I mean, they were just all like. To, to me, the preoccupation with the soda was sort of a metaphor. It was. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was like, oh, you're worrying about the soda. <laughs> I think there's a bigger. No, because, <laughs> but here's the thing. The soda was so bad for him because he had gastric bypass. No, I understand. So it was like eating his insides. I get it. So, I get the why you were concerned. Yeah. But, it, but it became so such a metaphor for a bigger monster that was is on his back. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> I can't wait for people to see the film so they understand the context yeah, of all of this. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't yeah. wait either. I, I really want them to see it. And, and I'm hoping our conversation today really whets their appetite to see it because you will see Ralph and May in all his funny and in all his poignancy. I mean, it is a deeply poignant – I think that's where all the funny came from. It, 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 you're, you're not going to walk away hating Ralph and May. I hope not, yeah. No, no, I don't no, think no, so. No. You'll feel bad. And I, and I don't think even if people get angry with you you know, for the codependency, they're not going to end up hating you. They're going to end up frustrated. Because codependency is a frustrating thing to watch. It's like you get it, and it's like, oh, stop, 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 please, stop, please, stop. Please, stop. And, and I think they're going to um, feel deeply for your kids. And, and a lot of people will relate to it because a lot of people have addict alcoholic parents. Oh my. It's a terribly common thing, right? And a lot of people come from divorce these days, so it's not something that uh, people don't know about. But I, God, there's a part of me that. I was just thinking about them, your kids later, like a few years down the line, what their perspective is once they've had therapy and stuff, like in a few years under their belt, really a way to conceptualize, you know, what this was for them. They have, they won't see this for a while. Oh, no, I don't, yeah. mean see the, I don't mean see the documentary. I mean how they make sense of their dad and their life. It'd be very interesting. I, I don't know. Hopefully you, you'll be able to access that yeah <laughs> well i i think though i think you can look forward to them because you're doing all the right stuff to help them be able to do that it, it will they, they will make their own sense of it i hope so i mean like i keep them in how I've, I've done enough understanding like kids that um are in sports are less likely to to go towards addictions mm-hmm. and you know things like that and and just being able to talk a lot helps through that process i i mean i have a really novice understanding of it all but like i've have them in sports and activities and try and keep and, them and, stimulated and therapy, in life. you're in therapy those are very 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 critical pieces good that, that, that everybody's doing the work and in, in an excellent program too how did you find out about maple counseling center um my kid's preschool teacher valerie that she's just the the sweetest woman and she told me about it because it's affordable it's affordable and it's but it's rare that they they it's that it's so excellent it's really excellent care and they'll they'll get you the services no matter what when well, you have to go the, every week i get it so, you gotta do your part but, yeah but those two but those two pieces of being really good 
and they'll they'll get you the care. That that's that makes great services. That's a great center. Yeah. So that's been good. Well, uh, Mr. Producer, you have any questions for Lana? You're, no, she, she, you're ready to go see the documentary. I'm going to take yes, you. Yes, absolutely. All right. <laughs> well, uh, anything more you want to say about yourself or the doc or where people can oh. find more information? We said LanaTurner.com and at Lana Turner on Twitter. Yeah, I want to say I'm like over the moon excited that you're going to be well, involved in I, this. I, I'm a fan of yours. I'm a fan of his. And when uh, I was asked to look at it, I was like, let me take a look. And I just want to do whatever I can to help it because it, oh. it's, it's, I just feel like it's going to have a real impact. And, and I, <laughs> Ralphie's life is not, f- it's unfinished. It's an unfinished story, right? And maybe this doc will be part of the, the completion of his his impact in helping people understand a lot of different things that he was struggling with and then give us the comedy on the other side when you come out with that comedy special because <laughs> I want both. I want both pieces really badly. Um, but I think What's Eating Ralphie May will be deeply, deeply meaningful for a lot of people. It's I really it's really so. something. And I know he's got plenty of fans out there just will want to know his story. So congratulations on that. Thanks, And uh, hopefully a lot of people will see it. And... Um, I want to thank everybody. Check uh, doctor.com social CBD. Don't forget that. Latest podcast and uh, YouTube channel. Don't forget Dr. After Dark. And uh, again, thanks uh, to Nate for all the work for us over these years and Caleb Nation and Michelle Poe for setting up the new studio. We appreciate you guys. And uh, more to come. We'll see you next time. All right, that's about it for this episode of This Life. Thanks for listening and subscribing on your favorite platforms. Rate us five stars and tell a friend. Also, be sure to visit drdrew.com for the latest news. We'll tell you where you can find all of our health-related content. So go to drdrew.com. Please tell a friend, and we thank you for it. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.